Well, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. <clears throat> uh, the story I want to tell about today <clears throat> has to do with the evolution of a system before there was any, any tree on Earth, any plant, uh, when there was no oxygen, which is the evolution of the system, which is called photosystem two, which is a complex protein that evolves um, oxygen by transforming um, water into the separation of charges that leads to oxygen evolution and reduction of quinone cofactors, <coughs> which is one way of initiating photosynthesis. And in that process, we want to learn what are the underlying principles of the functionality of natural photosynthesis so that we can replicate that in synthetic systems, in molecules that we can make in the lab for running artificial photosynthesis, for using solar light, water, and air to make fuel. So that's, that's what photosynthesis does, and that's what we still don't know how to do today synthetically or artificially. <coughs> so don't be afraid there are no Hamiltonians and no quizzes at the end of the talk. Uh, but <coughs> first of all, I want to present the, the people involved a, in, my, in the, the research in my group, and particularly Crystal and Ka and Misha, who are responsible for all the work on the study of the natural system. And the rest of the group works on artificial photosynthetic uh, models, uh, as well as on the development of methods for uh, analyzing both artificial and natural photosynthetic problems. So Crystal, Ka, and Misha are experts in, in, in Yenge. <laughs> and when they don't play Yenge, they, they worry about photosynthesis. And so within any photosynthetic organism, if you zoom in into one of those green leaves, you might wonder what is the chemistry that rules the functionality and the energetics of, of that system. So you might want to zoom into one of those cells. <coughs> and what you see is that the, the, the leaves are green because the cells have these organelles, these blobs that are called chlor chloroplasts, that are green, and that's why the leaf is green. And those chloroplasts are like little bacteria that are embedded in the, in, in the cells. Plants incorporated bacteria somehow I transform into, into these photosynthetic organisms uh, or photosynthetic organelles within the cells. And so if you zoom in to one of those chloroplasts, you will see that the chloroplast is green because it has in internal membranes, like the internal membranes of bacteria, that are green. So that's where the chlorophyll pigments are inside of these internal membranes of chloroplasts. And if you want to know where exactly within that, that membrane the pigment uh, resides, so you have to zoom in a little bit better. And, and this is one of those lipid bilayers. <coughs> well, they happen to be loaded with these protein complexes, which are aggregates of proteins that operate in synergy, and within one of those uh, complexes called, uh, the, the new complex is called photosystem two, uh, you, have, you have, zooming in a little bit more, this is that protein complex at atomic, uh, atomistic resolution, you have all kinds of uh, chlorophyll pigments loading these proteins called the antenna proteins uh, in, in the overall complex. So, the absorption of visible light is due to these chlorophyll pigments that are loaded on the proteins on photosystem two. They're responsible for light harvesting. And the process of photosynthesis is initiated there. So going back one slide, it's initiated in that system within the antenna system of photosystem two. So the energy is harvested by inducing an electronic transition, usually a pi-pi star transition in the, in the chlorophylls, and when one of these pigments gets electronically excited in that way, it fills the interaction with nearby chlorophyll pigments of other uh, groups nearby, so the energy sometimes is transferred by simple co collision, collisions into other chlorophyll pigments, and the energy is funneled into a special pair called the P680 pair. So that's the story of the initial 
energy harvesting in the, in the antenna system of photosynthesis. So all the energy is finally uh, congregated here in the P680 special unit, which is a special pair of chlorophyll species. Um, and that is next to a chlorophyll unit that is missing the magnesium in the center. It's called pheophytin. So, and that pheophytin has a real potential. It's downhill relative to the, speci the special pair. So what it happens over there is that when this special pair gets excited, it induces an electronic translocation. So an electron is transferred from the special pair onto the pheophytin, leaving the special pair oxidized and the pheophytin reduced. So that is a primary charge separation process that converts the solar energy into charge se separation in the, in the two picosecond time scale. Now, the electron that is now parked on, on the pheophyting sees that nearby there is another redox cofactor, which happens to be a quinone, which is quinone A, that can get reduced even more easily than, than pheophyting. So the, the electron gets transferred to the quinone, and from there it goes to quinone B that can also be reduced even uh, with more uh, facility than, than quinone A. <coughs> and in that way, the electron migrates all the way to the, that side of the protein. And what, you, what I want you to think of this protein is <coughs> this cluster that is embedded in the, in the membrane. So here is the, where the membrane uh, is, is positioned. <coughs> so in a way, what you leave behind is a hole buried here in the special pair, and an electron now parked on the squinon cofactor that is called the plastoquinone. So now, once the chlorophyll species gets oxidized, now it has oxidizing power. That means it can extract electrons from something that is nearby. <coughs> so one possibility is to extract it from this squinon cofactor that was reduced. And sometimes that happens. But this is far away, so the rate at which that happens is very, very slow. So the, the recombination process is prevented by this, uh, this uh, charge separation process. So instead what it does, it extracts an electron from a tyrosine residue that is, that is near a little piece of manganese oxide that is buried on this inside of this protein that is in here highlighted in yellow that is called the D1 protein subunit. So the tyrosine gets oxidized now. The redox state of the special pair is reestablished. And so now we have the hole in the tyrosine, the electron on the plastokinon, and now the tyrosine can oxidize something. And what it oxidizes is that little piece of manganese oxide that is the catalytic site where oxygen evolves, where water reacts and two water molecules come together to make O2. <coughs> so water is taken from the other side of the membrane. As you see here, water is binds to that cluster. And when it gets sufficiently oxidized, it can react and make oxygen. And all the oxygen we are breathing <coughs> at this very moment has been generated in this way. And so, because as I mentioned, there was no photosystem to or oxygen 2.5 billion years ago on Earth. <coughs> now, uh, as, as you realize, <coughs> what you need is to extract four electrons from two water molecules in order to make one molecule of oxygen for and for protons. So somehow you have to accumulate here in the, in the catalytic center four missing electrons. And so far we have accumulated only one by this process. So when it, when it happens, it happens, the whole process happens again. So another photon comes in, induces electronic translocation, and oxidizes the cluster one more time. After the second time, the plastokinon that gets reduced twice uh, it affects the, the PK of nearby amino acid residue on this side of the membrane. Mm -hmm. There's a histidine residue, histidine 252, that is nearby this plastoquinone. And so it increases the PK of that histidine. Usually histidine has a PK of 6.1, and it raises, raises it to about 8. And now that histidine can recruit a proton from the other side of the membrane. So it, it increases the, the pH of this side of the membrane is called the stroma by extracting protons. So now it gets reduced and protonated. And when plastoquinone gets reduced and protonated, it loses affinity for that niche where it is bound. So it comes off and it diffuses to the membrane <coughs> and it goes to initiate further steps 
downstream in photosynthesis, leaving an, an empty cavity there that is refilled by a fresh plastokinone because there's a reservoir of fresh plastokinone here in a, in a pocket inside of the membrane. That process of, of replenishing fresh plastokinone is the rate limiting step of photosynthesis. So if you want to design plants that grow faster, that have more efficiency of photosynthetic processes, that is the process you have to engineer. <coughs> now, um, one, once you park here a fresh quinone, then you are ready to repeat this process two more times. And after the second time you do that, then you have accumulated four holes in the oxygen evolving complex, and those missing electrons are in the form of a high valence state of manganese centers in this, in this piece of manganese oxide. So all the, the manganese centers are four plus now. They're all fully oxidized, and they can oxidize water by extracting four electrons from water <coughs> to generate oxygen, releasing four protons to the lumen, which is this other side of the membrane. So as a result, you reduce the pH of the lumen, you increase the pH of the stroma, creating a pH gradient that is the driving force for ATP biosynthesis further down the, 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 the stream. So, so here's the ATPS, where, where all that free energy uh, gradient is transformed into ATP, into a chemical bond. So that's the way you make fuel for the plant from all the energy that is harvested from the sun. So what we've been uh, stu uh, studying a lot, and what I'm going to be emphasizing, <coughs> is the nature of this catalytic site, because that's where the magic happens. That's where water binds and reacts <coughs> with uh, very little effort, you see, because the light that is available from the sun is mostly visible light and, in and infrared. We have very little ultraviolet. <coughs> so these uh, chlorophyll pigments absorb in the visible range. So you have um, uh, very little uh, energy. Nevertheless, you're able to oxidize water. This is a very uh, demanding reaction uh, that you know it doesn't happen when you put a glass of water exposed to sunlight. Right? Just water evaporates, but it never makes oxygen. So Somehow, if we want to transform water into oxygen, electrons and protons, and use perhaps the electrons and protons to make fuel, as the plant does, or maybe just to make hydrogen, which is another form of fuel, we want to know how to make this kind of catalyst that we could sprinkle in a glass of water and make it produce oxygen out, you know, with, driven with, with solar light. <coughs> so that's what uh, we decided to study. And there was, as, uh, at that point, uh, when we started with this work, <coughs> uh, breakthroughs in X-ray crystallography. So there were X-rays of PS2 for the first time with beautiful resolution of the, of the structures. And as I showed here, you see you have all of the proteins, all of the pigments, all of the amino acid residues were resolved. And even there was some a level of, of resolution for the position where the oxygen evolving complex was. Here in blue, what you have is the electron density map that results from the scattering process of, of X-rays. But as you see, it has very low resolution. This, uh, this was obtained at 3.5 angstrom resolution, which is not enough to detect where the individual atoms are. They're not individual, uh, uh, individually resolved atoms or even individually resolved bonds. What you see is the whole blob, and inside of that whole blob, you can try to fit a model like the one you have here in yellow <coughs> to see whether there is an atomistic model consistent with that broad electron density map that comes from the X-ray diffraction. And there were many possible models that would fit. This is just one. But at the moment, there were 44 models that would be just as consistent with this ex uh, experimental data as uh, this particular model. We favor this particular model because it was proposed not only on the basis of this electron density map, but also on the basis of information that came from high resolution spectroscopy, which is uh, X-ray absorption and EPR spectroscopy. So with um, X-ray absorption is an alternative technique for exploring the nature of uh, and distances in the system because the X-rays are not scattering X-ray, but the X-ray is being absorbed, in this case, by the manganese centers. If you tune the energy of the X-ray, 
you can shine X-rays with energy that is sufficient to extract a core electron from manganese and make a free electron that comes off. So this photoelectron detachment um, by X-rays. And when any of these manganese centers ejects an electron, it ejects an electron that looks very much like a, like a wave, like a wave of water, because in the electron is a wave. <coughs> and so the electron expands, and when it finds a scattering center, something that is standing in its way, it bounces back. So the wave bounces off any of these other centers that are nearby, including other manganese centers that were nearby, very much like a wave of water scattering off a dock. Right? So it interferes with itself. It creates an interference pattern um, that affects the probability of X-ray absorption by that center. So, <coughs> so that is that probability, you know, the intensity of X-ray uh, absorption by that center, has information on the distances of scattering centers nearby, so the coordination sphere of that, of that center. So with that technique, I'm going to be talking a little bit more later about that technique, they had concluded that the distances between manganese centers were about 2.7 angstroms. So they were, um, th they have distances of uh, 2.7 angstroms, sometimes two, sometimes three. And there were also distances that were long, they were about 3.3 angstroms that were determined with very high accuracy. And so they were determined with you know, 0 0.05 angstrom resolution, so 0 0.05 angstrom error. So these, these are correct. So what Jim Barber did here was to try to fit a model where all the manganese centers had about 2.7 angstroms because of that reason. And it was also known from EBR and, and Endor data that the model structure that could fit in this was a little bit of a cuboidal structure, like a dice, where the manganese centers were at the edges of that dice. Um, and also that there was a dangling manganese. Uh, the student involved in this project, in the BR project with uh, David Brett and co-workers at UC Davis, called this one the, the dangling manganese. Uh, so, so that name, name is uh, remain. And so this is the model that, that Jim Barber uh, proposed in co consistency with, in consistent with this high resolution X-ray data. But there were many aspects of this model that were unsatisfactory. For one reason uh, was that, first of all, the, the electron density map was very broad. And there were many, many models that could be uh, consistent with that data. So some of the experts in the field call a beautiful model, call this work, in this work, a beautiful model with very little data supporting. Um, in addition, there was no water result in this structure, so it's not clear where water binds, if it binds, and it's known that it binds and reacts. <coughs> and, and so the, there are parts that are missing. And, and the manganese centers, if you count each of these manganese centers according to EPR, it should be uh, manganese centers that are high valent. That means they have charge of plus three or plus four. And when manganese has that oxidation state, he has a covalency of five or six. So he, each of these might have five or six ligands. That is something you learn in the inorganic chemistry class. Uh, and if you count here, you have fewer. So there is something wrong. So all these problems <coughs> had to do with radiation damage. When you collect X-ray diffraction data, you expose the sample to so much X-ray radiation that you generate free electrons. And the electrons go around and reduce whatever is reducible. And from the whole system, the part that is m more easily reducible is the oxygen evolving complexes, because that's the part that has high valent metal centers, manganese 4 and manganese 3. So these, these manganese centers are fully reduced in the X-ray diffraction data. They're all manganese 2. And as you must have learned from inorganic chemistry, when you reduce the oxygen state of the manganese center, then it, it loses affinity for the ligands. So the, the ligands come off, and the cluster disassembles. And so that's why it creates the structural disorder. And that's why you have a blob with very low resolution. Here, each of these metal centers have an error or of more than one angstrom. So it could be anywhere <laughs> within a sphere of one angstrom from where they were placed. <coughs> Nevertheless, we thought this was the best empirical model available at the time. This is about 13 years ago. <coughs> and we decided to redefine the oxidation state of the manganese centers 
according to EPR spectroscopy, so put them back in manganese 4 and manganese 3, and re-optimize the structure of ligands to see whether we can find out how the ligands bind and whether there is water, there is any room left for water to bind, because somewhere water has to bind and react. Um, and also, it was known that if you depleted the uh, PS2 system from chloride, because chloride binds somewhere, then it stopped producing oxygen. So chloride had to be central to the mechanism of oxygen evolution, to that reaction by which two water molecules react to make oxygen. Nevertheless, there was no chloride or any hint of chloride nearby the, the OEC. Uh, so we decided to start with that and implement the method we discussed yesterday at the quantum chemistry class, which is a combination of quantum mechanics and molecular mechanics techniques. So the OEC and its surrounding ligands is described with DFT, and everything else is described with a force field at the molecular mechanics level. And with Gaussian, that method was uh, already implemented in the form of electronic embedding, so the distribution of charges surrounding the OEC could influence the electronic density in the core, in the, in the oxygen revolving complex. So that was a nice feature because you had polarization effects. But this method does, doesn't include the reaction, the polarization of the distribution of charges in the surrounding cavity due to the distribution of charge in the oxygen evolving complex. So we developed a method for doing that, which is uh, this uh, DFT QMM self consistent protein polarization approach that uh, we also discussed yesterday. Uh, where uh, each of the fragments in the cavity is polarized one at a time, and the charges are recomputed with the QMMM approach. And when we come back and we try to recompute the charges of that fragment, the surrounding environment now is updated with the distribution of charges and geometry uh, in the previous round of calculations. So next time we reparameterize the charges of that fragment, all this is going to be taken into account. And after repeating this a few times, five times usually, the process converges, and you have a self-consistent description of the distribution of charges in the cavity, as, as uh, consistent with the distribution of charge in the core. And mathematically, that's that's uh, how we do it in terms of the electrostatic potential due to the DFT description with the DFT density, and here the electrostatic potential with the distribution of single-point atomic charges that we fit to reproduce that electrostatic potential from DFT calculations. So um, the trick was to do this right, and the way we, we did it was each time we polarize a fragment, we cap it with fragments and that are not polarized, so that the effect of clipping bonds when we, uh, we, we define a fragment is not an artifact of the repolarization effect, because it's far away from the core that it's impolarized. And then we move the center to a nearby amino acid ratio. We repeat the process over and over until uh, we, we get a complete description of polarization effects. And when we do that, we end up having, as we mentioned yesterday, uh, corrections over the charges of atomic centers, uh, sometimes more positive, sometimes more negative, and of about 15 to 20 percent corrections on the overall charge of the of the center. So they're not big charges, big uh, changes, but there are many. And when you accumulate all those corrections over the interface that uh, of the quantum mechanics region and the surrounding environment, then that leads to large large corrections of about 15 to 20 kcal per mole. And those corrections are necessary when one is trying to elucidate the structure of the OEC and is in its surrounding ligand environments. So by implementing that method, we came up with this model, which is, yes, a cuboidal structure was quite consistent with these calculations, although it's slightly different from what the, d the <coughs> crystallographic data predicted, because this one has water, so there are water molecules bound to calcium and to that dangling manganese. We have an additional myoxo bridge, and we have a complete coordination of each manganese center with five or six ligands. We also have chloride bound nearby. <coughs> uh, and we suggested that the mechanism by which oxygen forms has to do with the reaction of these two water molecules that bind like terminal water molecules. <coughs> so, so an intermediate step in that process is the deprotonation and oxidation of one of the two water molecules to make this oxyl radical. And then this nucleophilic attack of one water molecule onto that oxyl radical to make this 
hydroperoxo intermediate. This is subsequently oxidized one more time and deprotonated to make O2, and that's why we breathe. Uh, so <clears throat> other people disfavor this mechanism because there was no evidence for water bound to the OEC and because our calculations were based on an empirical model that had huge amounts of error. Right? And they favor instead the reactivity of myoxo breaches that perhaps form a similar intermediate by direct uh, condensation of, of, of those uh, myoxo breaches. <clears throat> Today, we don't really know what the mechanism is. Um, but what I want to mention, and, and that's the subject of this presentation, is that today we have a way of assessing which one is more consistent with experiments. And uh, so that's a little bit of the end of the story <coughs> for, for the oxygen evolving process. Uh, one of the reasons why people favor this mechanism versus the terminal water molecules, in addition to the lack of evidence for water, terminal water molecules, the OEC, is that when you, when you place any of these complexes with terminal water molecules in water, then the terminal water molecules exchange with water in the bulk very quickly in the picosecond time scale. But the reaction time for oxygen evolution, as it would happen for these two water molecules, as measured by X-ray fluorescence uh, uh, experiments in this system, is the, the millisecond time scale. So it takes about one to two milliseconds for each pair of water molecules to react and make oxygen. So they have to stay bound to the catalytic side for about a millisecond. So it's just orders of magnitude slower than the rate of exchange of terminal water molecules with this kind of transition metal complexes. Uh, so that was another one. And so in, for that reason, they favor this one because myoxo breaches stay for a lot longer. They exchange at a much uh, slower rate. What we found through calculations with QMMM calculations, and by the way, were awarded the, the, that methodology was awarded the, the Nobel Prize of Chemistry in 2013 to Warshall, Levitt, and Karplus, to, who developed QMMM methods, um, was that the exchange rate for this particular set of water molecules is much slower than when we place the water, the, this complex, in solution, because the surrounding cavity doesn't have a complete solvation shell of water. So removing these water molecules has a free energy penalty. And, and the water molecules that are detached from the cluster has very much uh, frustrated solvation and st stabilization uh, that leads to a barrier, free energy barrier of about 16 kcal per mole consistent with a millisecond time scale. So even the, the rate of exchange of water molecules for this model of ours is in the millisecond time scale. So that sort of points at one of the the tricks that nature must have evolved in this, with the evolution of this system, which is designing a low dielectric environment that stabilizes water bound to the OEC so that they would stay for, for, a, for milliseconds. And, um, and that, uh, that might also give structural stability to the OEC because many times when we put this kind of complexes in water, they just disassemble by, by solvation so because the ions can fully solvated, and they're unstable. But instead, by placing this piece of manganese oxide buried inside of the D protein, uh, the D1 protein subunit, then the whole stability of the cluster is, is, is enhanced, and the stability of substrate water molecules is also further enhanced. So in 2011, Shenron Shen and co-worker finally resolved the structure of PS2 at 1.9 angstrom resolution, where you can already see bonds with the, with the electron density maps. And this is the model they proposed. Uh, this was a poster that was uh, submitted uh, to the International Conference in Photosynthesis. It was in Beijing in 2011. I was not there. I was in Boston at an ACS meeting at the time that this happened. But Gary was here. And he tells me that, um, that the poster was promoted to a small talk because the work was finished by the time the, the conference was organized. And when he showed this data, uh, this work was received with a standing ovation, in five minutes of loss. Uh, so, and we were, he emailed me immediately, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> yeah, finally, for the first time, there is evidence for the terminal water molecules that we had suggested, even the presence of chloride next to the OEC, and a complete coordination of manganese centers 
There were some as, as small changes that needed to be addressed. For instance, here, this aspartate residue, we, we had suggested it was a monodentate to the dangling man manganese and came out as breaching between the dangling manganese and calcium. Here is the, the breaching. So with those corrections, we could go ahead, uh, re-optimize, and test whether the model confirm the experimental data based on X-ray absorption. And that's what we did. We, we calculated that pattern that, uh, the interference of the intensity of X-ray absorption as a function of the energy of X-rays. Here is reported as the kinetic energy of the photodetached electron. But you see this is the interference phenomenon that if you Fourier transform, you get in reduced space the positions of the first coordination sphere, second coordination sphere, and that position of those bands is what it is determined at very high accuracy, with very high precision of 0 0.05 angstrom. And here, this, this is not a very good figure, but what you see, there are two lines. The red line is the experimental data from our collaborators, Holger Dow and Michael Haumann, uh, who are from the Frey University in Berlin, and did this work at the Grenoble synchrotron. And in black, our, ca our calculations of the multi-scattering process of the electron that gets bounced back from the scattering center, comes back and interferes with itself. And as you see, they're right on top of each other. And this is isomorphous and data. That means it's an average of all possible orientations of incidence of the X-ray beam. And this is the same calculation now comparing to data coming from the Berkeley group, Vitalia Chandra and Junko Yano from the Kensauer group that, that grew single crystals of PS2 and run this, the same experiments so now it's along the principal axis of the single crystal. So this is the most detailed pieces of experimental data available. And again, the, the QMMM model passes a very stringent test in structural characterization. So with that in hand, we decided to go ahead and see whether we could explore <coughs> the activation process by which that why this catalyst is able to oxidize water. And so <coughs> it has been known and, and observed for a long time now that if you analyze that X-ray absorption spectrum uh, before and after flashing, uh, the system with a pulse of light, then the, the, the features change quite dramatically. For instance, this bimodal distribution coalesces into a single band. So that has been observed for a long time, but there was no understanding of why that happens and wh why this is necessary for activating the catalyst, for getting the catalyst in a state that is able to oxidize water. So what we decided to do is to prepare the system in that most reduced state, in S0, and and, and induce the oxidation and deprotonation, because it's known that in this advancement of the oxidation state, the system also deprotonates, uh, to see whether we could reproduce these changes in spectroscopy. And as you see, the, the calculations do reproduce the bimodal dis distribution changing into a single band. And since we have agreement with experiments, now we can go and see what happened to the structure of the OEC in this transformation. And what we see is the following, that from all of the manganese centers that can get oxidized, the one that, is, that gives off its electron is this manganese 3 that changes from manganese 3 to manganese 4. It becomes from blue to green. And when that happens, it's more possibly charged. So now it attracts uh, more this ligand that is a ligand of calcium, that is anyway, an OH ligand, that now gets closer to the manganese center and forms this additional myoxo bridge that was not existent here because in this dotted line is too far away from making a bond. So now there is a demyoxo bridge here and, uh, and in that process of getting close to this Lewis acid, then it gets deprotonated. You see? So that's why this process involves oxidation of the manganese center and deprotonation of an OH ligand. One drives the other one. <coughs> and if you compute the free energy change of this transformation, it is lower than the free energy change that is required to either oxidize that center or deprotonate that ligand. So removing a, an electron or removing a proton costs more uh, energy than doing both at, at the same time. And the reason for that is that the surrounding environment is a low dielectric environment. So advanced accumulating charge in the system is more costly than keeping the, the whole system with the same amount of charge. So that's one of the tricks that nature discovered. 
which is called proton coupled electron transfer. And any design of artificial photosynthetic systems must explode, exploit these, this, you should not explode anything, you should exploit uh, that trick, um, which enables the transformation and accumulation of, of oxidizing equivalents without accumulating charge. It's a little bit counterintuitive that that is possible, but in fact it is possible because you also deprotonate the system. <coughs> so um, that's a uh, bottom line of, of the mechanism of, of advancing the oxidation state. And the origin of this transformation in the spectroscopic signature has to do with the fact of form forming an additional mioxo bridge. Because now with a demioxo bridge, the manganese manganese distance is no longer 2.9, it becomes 2.7. So that peak that was 2.9 shifts towards 2.7 and now they are the coalesces into a single band. So this spectroscopic change is reporting on a PCET that leads to formation of the demioxo bridge, critical for stabilizing the high oxidation state of the manganese center, in this case manganese 3. Um, in addition, with these models, we were able to explore how water binds to the OEC, substrate water molecules, these terminal water molecules that, that we favor. And what we find is that water gets into and binds to the catalytic side through this carousel mechanism. It's a re rearrangement of water molecules around this manganese center <coughs> that in, in the process of doing that, it forms this additional mioxo bridge and separation of this part of the cluster from the rest. So the cluster sort changes from closed to open in this, in this transformation. And as a result, the electronic density in the center of the cluster is decreased. And that was, again, a question that had puzzled the community for many years. Because when you in accumulate oxidizing equivalents, when you make manganese centers that are all four plus now, you would expect that the cluster would be more compact. right? But instead, from the analysis of XF data and X-ray absorption, they saw that some distances got longer. So that was uh, difficult to interpret. Uh, what we see here is that the manganese center gets so positive, that now enables binding an additional water molecule that gets deprotonated and forms this additional motif that separates from the cluster. So it is because it is more positive that it opens up the structure. And here we are comparing our calculations of the difference in electron density between one oxidation state and the other one of the OEC with recent results from the Petra and from and coworkers uh, from Arizona State University, who were able to run these experiments that are called femtosecond X-ray crystallography um, uh, experiments, um, which are the latest developments in the field. So now one uh, is in incredible that you can collect the diffraction pattern of X-rays, but using pulses that are only 50 femtoseconds long. So a pulse of X-ray is extremely intense, but goes through the sample with its width of 50 femtoseconds. And so the, the, the whole information is collected within 50 femtoseconds. And, and of course, it has so much intensity that it ends up e evaporating the sample. But by the time uh, that happens, you already have the spectrum collected, the image, the X-ray uh, diffraction pattern. So before any motion of the nuclear, nuclear centers can even start, you already have collected the data of X-ray diffraction because they are so short. So in its original formation, it was, it was presented as, as diffraction without destruction. So, so these problems that I mentioned at the beginning of radiation damage are non-existent here. Uh, we recently published a couple of papers questioning that, but that's, that's a detail that we can discuss <coughs> offline and, or, or further if you have questions. <coughs> Bottom line is that with that uh, methodology, you can run the experiments before and after flashing, and therefore you can collect the X-ray diffraction difference, the, the electron density difference, uh, without any problem of radiation damage. And we can do the same thing with our models in, and confirm this carousel mechanism for substrate water binding. Uh, in the same way, we could va validate that mechanism by exploring how ammonia binds to the cluster, because there is data, X-ray absorption data, that uh, we have been able to match by binding ammonia also to that terminal water molecule, where we suspect the substrate water molecule binds. And that also agrees with experiments. Therefore, uh, we have supported that 
carousel mechanism and the addition of one water molecule to the OEC in the S2 to S3 transition. <coughs> so now the big question is how, how the O bond forms and whether this mechanism of determining a water molecule is consistent with experimental data or not. So as I mentioned, X-ray fluorescence experiments have been performed on the OEC to measure the fluorescence of manganese centers. So if you have, it's very simple, this experiment is very simple. <coughs> well, not to run it, I mean to interpret it, is that if you have more electrons, you have more fluorescence. And if you oxidize the system, the fluorescence decays. That's all what it, this experiment reports. And as you see here, for instance, if you start with the S1 state and you flash, you give a flash of light, then the fluorescence decays. What is happening? You're losing electrons from a manganese center, right? So you're oxidizing the cluster. And from this profile, you can fit that to an exponential and get the rate for the oxidation process. And the time scale for that oxidation is 70 microseconds. So that's the way they determine that oxidation of the, of the cluster from what is called the storage state one to the storage state two takes about 70 microseconds. You give another flash, flash of light, another flash of light, the S2 gets oxidized again in a similar fashion, now in 190 microseconds. So that's how you, you accumulate the second oxidizing equivalent in the OEC. And if now you flash for the third time, the intensity of extra fluorescence increases. So what's going on? <laughs> Any ideas? Somehow, the cluster has been reloaded with electrons. Right? Those electrons come from water that was bound either from the myoxo bridges or from terminal water molecules, are now replenishing the electrons into the manganese centers. And that's why the fluorescence increases, because now the manganese centers have more electrons. And that's the process of water oxidation. So that's the, the process by which oxygen evolves, leaving behind the electrons and reestablishing the redox state of the cluster in the most reduced form. And then the cycle goes on and on. So each time you go through that process, you form one unit of oxygen. Now, that rate, you see, has two features that are very interesting. One is the lag phase. If you take a look at that lag phase, it's between 100 and 200 microseconds. So for 100 to 200 microseconds, nothing happens in terms of the oxidation state. It doesn't get reduced or oxidized. But after that, the, the oxygen state of manganese is changed so that now you have more electrons. And that takes about a millisecond. Someone, someone between one and two milliseconds is this process. So whatever mechanism we propose it has to be consistent with this kinetic data. And one aspect that was analyzed is the dependency with pH. So if you change the acidity of a medium in contact with and in the lumen, you know, whether you can change that rate or not, the, that rate of one to two milliseconds. What you see is very, uh, insensitive, and very insensitive to the value of pH in this range. That means that if there is a deprotonation process, and, and there must be a, a deprotonation at some point, um, it has to happen after the oxidation or at the same time as the oxidation. It cannot happen before, because if it happened before, then the rate would be determined by that rate limiting step. You know, one can slow it down by reducing the pH enough. And contrary to that, the rate is independent of the pH. So that's, that's one of the, of the constraints and that, that we have. So our work has been, in the, uh, in the last uh, year or so, has been focused on, on that process and seeing whether we can nail this experimental data. So trying to understand the molecular rearrangements uh, that lead uh, to bond formation at, at the slowest uh, step of the cycle and to explore whether the S3 to S4 transition involves, like the S0 to S1, a proton couple electron transfer transformation, or if it is an electron transfer followed by deprotonation, and whether the mechanism that is most consistent with experimental data is this terminal water mechanism that we proposed, or the oxyl oxo mechanism. Our proposal for the oxyl oxo, uh, for the terminal water mechanism, uh, 
was uh, previously suggested with model systems by Vincent Pecoraro, Gary Bradbig, and, uh, and, and Jim Barber in different times, in different uh, parts of the, of the study of Photosystem II. And we found that mechanism to be most consistent with our QMM models that have to be happen to be validated with this wealth of experimental data, including X-ray absorption. So uh, these are some of the transformations that we found. But in, in a nutshell, the main message that I want to emphasize is that the lag phase, that lag phase that has to do with, uh, th that is about 100 to 200 microseconds before formation of the oxygen uh, molecule, it is ascribed here in our mechanism to deprotonation of an OH ligand of the dangling manganese that forms that oxyl radical that is susceptible to nucleophilic attack by a water molecule. And, um, and, that, and that's why it is pH dependent, that lag phase. What is independent of, um, of pH is the O bond formation. So this is the nucleophilic attack of the water molecule and the oxyl radical forming a, a hydroperoxy intermediate and deprotonating this water molecule to the sumed ion. How about that? <coughs> so it forms this, this sumed ion. So there is a proton transfer concerted with the O bond formation. And the rate at which this O bond formation uh, takes place is determined by the energetics. Here is the free energy profile of that O bond formation process. And as you see, you, ha you have a free energy of activation of about 13.2 kcal per mole that is consistent with a millisecond time scale. So this process is consistent with the kinetic data from X-ray fluorescence. We could also compute the changes in this free energy profile by changing oxygen 16 to oxygen 18. That is called the kinetic isotope effect. How much this barrier changes when you make a heavy water attack the oxyl radical. And what we find is that there is a kinetic uh, isotopic effect of 25 per thousand, which is very consistent with the experimental data, not yet reported, but recently measured by Bradwick and co-workers. <coughs> so that is another test that is consistent with this mechanism. And third, it has a deuterium isotope effect because, as I mentioned, there is deprotonation formation of that Zundel ion. <coughs> so also, the deuterium isotope effect is 2.5 in the experimental data. Our calculation is 2, very much consistent uh, with one another. Now, in contrast, uh, the, um, so here is something to note, is that the, this uh, proposed intermediate structure formed upon deprotonation, the first intermediate, uh, should be detectable by vibrational spectroscopy. And a similar uh, uh, structure was proposed by uh, Mark Johnson and co-workers for clusters of waters. So it's not an unreasonable structure to, to suggest as a way of stabilizing that proton in an early state, a state of the translocation of the proton to the, to the lumen. Now, the issue of the kinetic isotope effect has to do with the Dolly effect. I'm sure <coughs> that you're all familiar with the Dolly effect, <coughs> which is that the isotopic composition of oxygen that we are breathing is different from the isotopic composition of water in the ocean. There's more oxygen 18 in the oxygen we breathe than, um, than the isotopic composition of water in the ocean. <coughs> so, and the reason for that is that the process of respiration consumes oxygen-16 faster than oxygen, and that's why we enrich the atmosphere with, with oxygen-18. Photosynthesis shows no kinetic isotope effect. So the ratio of oxygen-16-16 versus 16-18 is 1. So it doesn't distill oxygen-18 or oxygen-16 relative to the isotopic composition of the water that is provided as a substrate. Uh, but uh, that is under normal conditions because the rate limiting step, as I mentioned, is the acceptor side, that quinone that, that is being exchanged by fresh plastoquinone. So that's the, the rate limiting step. So the process of O bond formation might or might not have a kinetic isotope effect, but is not detected because that's not rate limiting. So what Gary has done recently 
was to see whether we could measure the kinetic isotope effect in the, in the donor side where the old bone formation is formed. And, and, and so what he did was to increase the concentration of that plastoquinone. Because usually it's, uh, you have eight plastoquinones per, per PS2. So what he did is to increase it to 400. So he puts a lot of, of electron acceptors. So now the acceptor side would not be uh, rate limiting. And also, he slowed down uh, the, the deprotonation by reducing the pH. And when you do those two factors, you, know, you increase the concentration of the electron acceptor and you reduce the pH, you start seeing a kinetic isotope effect of about 25 per thousand. And that's fully consistent with uh, the measured kinetic isotope effect that we reported. <coughs> now, how does the oxyloxo coupling mechanism work? So in that case, we have that it's just the O bond formation of the oxyl radical with the oxo bridge that has a kinetic iso isotope effect of 40 per thousand. So it's much higher. And there is an inverted deuterium isotope effect that is inconsistent with experimental data. So for the first time, we are able to favor one of the two proposals for the, for the O-bone formation by direct comparison with kinetic isotope effects and kinetic data. And this is the summary of the data I just described. And with that understanding, now we can start analyzing biomimetic synthetic models <coughs> that operate under the same principle. So one of, that, of those models is a, center, is, a, is a manganese terpy dimer that was reported by Crabtree and, and Bradwick in 1999 in science, which is able to split water and form oxygen uh, once the manganese centers are activated with a primary oxygen, with something that extracts electrons from it. In that case, with oxone, the, the primary oxidant responsible for activation of the manganese terpy dimer. <clears throat> As you see here, you have a manganese, uh, two manganese centers with a dimioxo bridge, very much like the, in the OEC. And what we found computationally is that the mechanism uh, responsible for all bone formation uh, driven by this complex also involves an oxyl radical, just like the dangly manganese, and a nucleophilic attack of a water molecule to oxyl radical, just like in the natural system. So that's why this complex, we thought, is a uh, truly biomimetic uh, mimic of, of photosystem. This is, these are the intermediates that can be computed with, with Gaussian for that manganese terpy dimer, showing that, in fact, the intermediate is an oxyl radical, and that that oxyl radical is um, attacked by water to form the hydroperoxy intermediate, as we propose in the oxygen-evolving complex, and that le leads to formation of the superoxo that then forms triplet oxygen, that is what we breathe. Um, so one aspect of these calculations was also to reveal that uh, one of the steps in the, in the cycle is manganese 2. As I mentioned, that manganese 2 is very unstable right, because it doesn't have affinity for the ligands. So this catalyst is very fragile. And Bob Crabtree calls it a, a Fabrice. So you touch it and it breaks, right? Uh, perhaps that's another lesson that we should learn from nature and from biomimetic models of, of natural systems, which is for these catalysts to be functional, to be able to catalyze water oxidation, they have to be very unstable. In fact, the OEC in plants gets a reform every 20 minutes inside of the, green, inside of the thalakoid membranes of green plant chloroplast, while the pigments survive for the whole season how they're coming off the, the trees, but, but they, they hold their... So instability leads to kinetics, favors kinetics versus thermodynamics, and somehow magnetic centers with ligands that are very labile are good for, for this process. So the, the turnover numbers for this catalyst is only <coughs> three or four. So it goes three or four times before it breaks into pieces and has to be reformed. One <coughs> solution to that is to put a high concentration of it, an excess of ligand in the solution so that it can reform very quickly. But uh, another aspect that is very important is the, the functional role of ligands. 
So here I showed that there's a, an acetate ligand that is not in the original formulation of this catalyst. Um, but it happens to be that the catalyst is shown to work much better when you put in an, an acetate buffer. And what we find is that the acetate moiety replaces one of the water molecules into the manganese center. And that's two things by that. It reduces the oxidation potential for that center, so it can be oxidized more easily. And also, it works <coughs> as a buffer, so it can pick up the, the protons that are extracted uh, from the water that is, that is undergoing the nucleophilic attack. So those carboxylate residues that are holding the OEC in place might be serving the same role, might be stabilizing the, st the structure of the OEC, and might be facilitating the oxidation of the manganese centers. And the carbox uh, carboxylate residues in the second coordination sphere might be responsible for picking up the proton that has to come off the substrate water molecules in the process of deprotonation towards the lumen. <coughs> Both of, of those design principles should be, again, exploited by artificial uh, synthetic models. What we have shown is that this manganese therapy dimer can be bound to TiO2 surfaces. So this is uh, another QMM model. And it, we should still operate well we found that the oil bond formation does um, go well with, with this arrangement. And that motivated uh, my coworkers and, and colleagues to work on this uh, on this design, to actually try this in the, in the lab. And they, in fact, they were able to stabilize the manganese therapy dimer on TiO2 surfaces. And when activated with the primary oxygen, in this case was cerium, that doesn't work for the homogeneous case, but it works when it is but on the surface, it still works well and, and it generates a lot of oxygen. So the, the catalyst re remains active when bound to TiO2 surfaces, as predicted by calculations. What we haven't been able to do is to induce this oxidation of water with the catalyst bound to TiO2 surfaces with, with light. We're able to do it with a primary oxygen like cerium, but we still have not been able to do it with light. And that um, that is still a challenge that I want to talk a little bit more about. But what I'm showing here is the movie of the evolution of the wave function, the, the distribution of, of charge. This is the electronic density right after photo excitation of that complex, the manganese therapy dimer um, bound to the surface. Let's see whether this one can play again. Here it is. Right after photo excitation, the electronic density in, in gray is now being injected into the TiO2 surface. And you see here the d orbitals of titanium picking up that electron, leaving an oxidized terpy ligand. So that is the same thing as the oxidized chlorophyll um, and the special pair of chlorophyll and residues. The electron, instead of going to field fighting Q, uh, QA and then QB, he has been injected into TaO2. But it's leaving behind an oxidized group, just like a chlorophyll species, that can oxidize a oxomanganese core that is like the OEC in natural photosynthesis system. So this is an artificial model of what actually happens inside of a green leaf. <coughs> and what these calculations show is that the time scale for this process of electron injection into the TiO2 surface is ultra fast. So it's in 100 femtoseconds, well, you know, 10 to the minus 15 seconds is one femtosecond. In 100 femtoseconds, the process is over, so the electron is all injected. And that's exactly what you want to have, an ultra-fast process of charge separation, like in the primary process of photosynthesis, where you translocate an electron from the spatial pair into field fighting in about two picoseconds, right? I think that uh, photons rain from the sun at a rate of uh, 2,000 photons per second per nanometer square. That's in, you know, under normal uh, average solar radiation. That means that you have to wait for about a millisecond. If you have a nanometer square where you have one of these molecules sitting on the surface for the next photon to, to strike, right? So, um, so you don't want the process to elect, of electron injection to take milliseconds because you'll be wasting photons. But what you show here is that that would not happen with this arrangement. This is very good for that kind of, of processes. And in fact, these kind of models have already been exploited in solar cells, and they're called the Gretzel cells, where you have similar uh, kind of, of transition metal complexes bound to TiO2 surfaces. And TiO2 
uh, you might be familiar with the TiO2 if you like PM, uh, like M&Ms. The M&M is written with TiO2. That's why it's white. Uh, TiO2 doesn't absorb visible light, absorbs only in the ultraviolet. That's why it's white. And it just scatters light. Um, and it's, it's non-toxic, it's cheap, and uh, it's natural. So um, this is a great material, and it also has great porosity. So it has uh, a lot of surface where you can put lots of these molecules attached to it in, a, in, in an electrode. So that's another design principle. So I'm, I'm running out of time, but I want to show you just a couple of, of slides of these experiments. Uh, this is the, the photocatalytic cell that is op operating in, in Gary Bradwick's group uh, with these electrodes designed with those principles. This is in, in the pink uh, TiO2 is when you decorate them with, with these complexes of manganese centers, it becomes pink. And when you shine light, here is the emulator of a solar spectrum coming through the, the fiber optics, hitting the photoanode, and here uh, the, the complex is oxidized. And what we're running here is the oxidation of isopropanol into acetone. That works. Uh, what we, it still hasn't worked is to replace isopropanol by water, so that to generate oxygen instead of acetone. And the reason for that, we think, and here is the photocurrent generated as a function of time, when we turn on the, the, the light, we establish a photocurrent, and we switch off the light. The photocurrent disappears when you switch it on back. It is reestablished, so it's clearly light dri driving this reaction. And the electrons that are being collected on this other side, they're generating hydrogen, which is a fuel. So this is converting solar light into fuel from, uh, in this case, extracting the electrons from isopropanol. This is not a good design because you're consuming a chemical. So you're consuming a fuel. But if that chemical happens to be water, that would be ideal. Because you can consume water, and when you make hydrogen react with oxygen, you regenerate that water. Mm -hmm. In this case, if you make hydrogen react with oxygen, you would not re regenerate isopropanol. So, so you would, it would be good if, if these were fuel cells that where hydrogen would be used to reduce acetone into isopropanol. And that, that would be a design of fuel cells that would make good use of solar energy in this way. But there are still challenges in terms of the membranes and catalyst for hydrogenation of acetone that could exploit uh, this principle. But the reason why this doesn't work with water, and this is where I would like to stop, is the following, that for two electron reactions like this one, everything works well because the first photon comes in, photo excites the ligand, injects an electron, and that oxidized ligand oxidizes the manganese center, evolving it from two to three. Then that happens again, it goes from three to four. The third time around is when, when things get difficult because the photon comes in, ex uh, excites these, this ligand, and then the photo excited electron has the choice of getting injected like the previous two or going back and reducing a manganese four center. And as you, as you know, manganese four center is thirsty for electrons, so you might attract that electron. So the electrons go in the wrong way and undo what the previous two uh, electrons have, have done. So, so reduce the center instead of advancing the oxidation state of the center further. So what we need here is to induce directionality of charge transfer to prevent the electron from going in the wrong way. And so we have to design uh, molecules that enable that directionality of charge transfer. As I mentioned, in photosystem two, that is enabled through that uh, redox gradient. So, so the redox cofactors that are, that are positioned, strategically positioned, so that they pick up the electron going downhill in free energy. But here, we don't have that, and we don't want to do that either. We don't want to copy all of the aspects of photosynthesis. because We don't want to waste voltage. What we want is to design molecular rectifiers that enable directionality of charge transfer without losing um, voltage. And that is, that, that is possible. Uh, and I'd be glad to discuss what, what we, the work we have done in the design of those uh, rectifiers. But with that, I would like to stop here by first uh, showing a picture of my colleagues. This is Bob Crabtree. We've been talking a lot about Bob uh, today <laughs> with the students. He's a great colleague and, and extremely inspiring and, and, and a true scientist in all possible ways. <laughs> 
um, is Gary Brandig, fantastic colleague as well, as well as, as uh, Charlie Schmutmeyer, with whom we've been working for more than 13 years now on, on this project. And these are uh, some of the students and postdocs uh, who work on the artificial photosynthetic materials. Uh, they are responsible for most of the ideas and the work that resolved the difficulties that we say when uh, that we faced, and for that we are extremely grateful for their commitment and and hard thinking and innovation into this project. And here's Misha, uh, Crystal, and Ka who are responsible for all the work, more, all the most recent work on Photosystem Two, the natural system. And with that, I would like to thank you again for your invitation and be glad to entertain questions. Yes, so here's one uh, specific application that would be revolutionary. Uh, if we could generate hydrogen in this way by uh, re using water here as the source of, of electrons and protons, then we would be transforming water into fuel. And in fuel that when uh, the, the fuel could be put directly into a fuel cell in a car and run an electric car, or uh, could be used for hydrogenation of liquids, so we could um, transform oil into butter, or we could uh, put it into a liquid that is been loaded in the tank of the car and sent to a fuel cell where it gets dehydrogenated and again generates electricity for running the car. Uh, so, in a way, we are transforming that energy, solar energy, into chemical energy, to making bonds. And, and it's wonderful because it doesn't pollute the atmosphere, doesn't increase the carbon footprint, simply because when hydrogen reacts with water, uh, sorry, with hydrogen reacts with oxygen, it generates a lot of energy and water. So water is the outcome of that combustion of, of hydrogen, if you want to call it a combustion. And so, um, you see a lot of smoke, but it's just steam, right? And so that would be one way of making use of, of this technology that would be really transformative. So if, if we imagine that, that, that formulation of what we call the virtual hydrogen um, technology, where you have fuel that you load into your car in, 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 in gas stations, but instead of being the normal fuel, it's this fuel that is some liquid that is hydrogenated. For instance, benzene that happens to be hydrogenated and making it cyclohexane. So what you load is cyclohexane. That is what goes to, to the engine, gets dehydrogenated, makes benzene. And as a result, uh, the, the protons and electrons that are extracted from cyclohexane are being used for running that fuel cell, reacting with oxygen, and therefore generating electricity. And then the, all the benzene that is produced in that way, can be dumped in the gas station, you can put more cyclohexane, and you never pollute the environment. You see, you only have to rehydrogenate it, or perhaps you can plug the car, and you can uh, hydrogenate benzene in reverse by running that, that in reverse. <coughs> so it would be a technology very similar to the one we have now, but with fuels that don't burn. They just get hydrogenated and dehydrogenated. And in the and that th there's a wide range of applications along the lines of that technology. But bottom line is that we want a sustainable uh, approach in, in the sense that we don't want to be consuming chemicals like we're doing, uh, consuming oil now. Uh, with this technology, we, uh, we extract the electrons from water, but we generate water again. So we never consume a chemical. So that's, that's what we call a sustainable uh, approach. And also, the amount of, of CO2 in the atmosphere will remain the same because it would not increase in the, the carbon footprint. Um, there are alternative ways of doing that, but this is one of the viable solutions. <coughs> 
from? Uh, we haven't come. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So the efficiency of plants is very low. Uh, so most of the energy is wasted uh, by plants because plants evolve <coughs> by re responding to an evolutionary pressure. So so long as they outcompete uh, the, com the competition, uh, they survive. And so um, most of the photons, and that's why they have a lot of leaves, and so they capture the photons. But not all of the photons are being used for, for growth. Um, but nothing grows under them. Right? So, so that's a, a little bit that not every single step in the, in, the, in the process of photosynthesis has been optimized to its limit, because what is being optimized is something beyond that process, uh, which is the, comp the, the evolutionary aspect. Uh, so um, less than 1% is uh, the efficiency uh, of, if you, amount, if you measure the biomass that is generated by a certain amount of energy uh, of photons that have been absorbed by, by those plants. Uh, so we think we can do much better than that. In, and in fact, Jacob, which was one of the centers in the California and focused on this problem, had set uh, a, um, a challenge of producing in the, ni in the next five years 10% efficiency, uh, uh, 10, um, um, uh, 10 milliamps per centimeter square of electricity. Uh, so, um, so that is achievable. Whether, uh, uh, whether there is an ultimate e efficiency limit uh, depends a lot on, uh, on the application. So same thing with, with, with solar cells. Um, but um, the, the aspect that I think is most important is the design principle based on earth abundant materials. So like manganese that is abundant and is not a precious metal <coughs> and that can be scaled. And so you can produce a lot of that and uh, perhaps you don't have to go to the ultimate limit of efficiency that is necessary for making it transformative. Mm -hmm. Now, both are excellent questions. So <clears throat> something that I, uh, when I presented you know, the, the process of initiation of photosynthesis, I stopped here in PS2, right? So um, apparently someone took a biochemistry class here and, and knew that there was a PS1 down the hill because now PS1, unfortunately it's called PS1, what comes after, but this one was discovered first, that's why it's called PS1, and this one is called PS2, but photosystem starts at PS2. So, <coughs> so the conjunction of, so both, both of them are necessary to uh, have enough free, en in, in free energy gradient here for driving ATP biosynthesis. Uh, so what is called, the, there is in the indeed uh, synergy be between the two protein complexes, <coughs> through a mechanism that is called a Z scheme. So because it's like a Z, a letter Z here goes up, down, and then up again. So it's a Z that is 90 degrees rotated. Uh, in the first part of the Z is one process of photoactivation. So it's one photon is absorbed here. Then it loses a lot of energy, goes downhill, and here another photon is absorbed. So it's a two photon process that leads to enough uh, um, pumping of, of protons from the stroma to the lumen as necessary for having in, in, in enough uh, driving force for ATP biosynthesis. So these schemes have been uh, a challenge that many people have been trying to develop as biomimetic versions of, of photosynthesis for the last five to ten years. And might be one of the, of the keys uh, to um, uh, to this process of both oxidizing water and reducing uh, uh, reducing uh, CO2, for instance, on the other side. Because doing both processes on one center, let's say on one 
TiO2 functionalized with complex might be too difficult. Uh, so it could be that on one piece of TiO2 with complexes, one oxidizes water and then transfers the electrons to the other one that also absorbs a photon and creates enough reducing power to reduce suction. Perhaps CO2 on this other side is reduced to met methanol. Uh, so if we want, we want to both fix CO2 and oxidize water, maybe we have to design um, models that mimic that Z scheme of photosynthesis. Now, in uh, your question, I think, might also have um, pointed at another possibility, which is to engineer uh, plant, in engineer perhaps PS1, uh, to produce fuel. And that's another line of research that people like John Goldbeck at Penn State are exploring. So what they're doing here, one of the um, functionalities of, of PS1 uh, is, again, absorb photons, uh, absor absorb light, separate charge, just like I described in PS2, and transfer those electrons all the way to free redoxing. That is uh, the, the way um, that electron is, is used for a reduction process. So one approach is to shortcut that electron transfer chain with an, another electron acceptor here, which may be a little piece of a, of a metal cluster or even a polymer that is attached to PS1 that has a catalyst that enables formation of hydrogen from you know, reduction of protons. So that by shortcutting PS1, we might be able to place there a wide range of catalysts that produce fuels. So these would be plants or algae that uh, would, would generate hydrogen in addition to generating oxygen. So, so it would, they would generate a mixture. And other schemes, like Danosera recently has been trying to overexpress uh, hydrogenases, uh, so which are enzymes <coughs> that would be able uh, to generate hydrogen. Uh, so that's yet another another approach that could be done without making any kind of materials. It is just engineering, modifying natural systems to produce fuel in, in a slightly different way as, as we are thinking uh, along the lines of semiconductor materials functionalized with molecules. 